Gangland, Trouble in Paradise by Media Mobsters, a real-time gangster strategy game released to absolutely no fanfare in late 2004. I have never heard anyone else talk about this game or its sequel. There are very few videos of it up online, the multiplayer is obviously dead, and not helped by GameSpy, no doubt. And I doubt this had anything in the way of marketing. After its release, Media Mobsters changed their name to Serious Games, released a bunch of stuff on the Game Boy Advance, and a spiritual sequel to Gangland, named Escape from Paradise City, and they have not done anything else since, and they're most likely dead. I bring all of this up, because how the fuck did 11-year-old me end up with a copy of this? I had no interest in real-time strategy, much less so in gangsters, particularly the Mafia. How did this end up on good old games? I mean, I am grateful for it, since I've long since lost my disc copy, and the last time I did have it, the copy protection was broken. But this must have been despite no interest from anyone. A bigger question, how the fuck did I end up with its sequel? You know, I've never been able to actually play this. No matter what I put on, it will not work. God, I just keep ending up with weird bullshit. Due to the relative scarcity of this game on YouTube, its age, and the fact that as a kid I never got beyond the fifth stage, this is going to be a review slash playthrough combo sort of dealy, spoiling a game you've likely not played, and honestly you don't really want to anyway. Walk a slightly dull path, then incredibly dull path of crime and revenge with me. Mario Mongano has some family problems. Used to have four brothers, now has three. And if it were up to him, he'd have even less. They were involved in the murder of Chico Mangano before heading off to America to start a new life, each of them. So, Mario's gonna follow them over there and put a stop to all that. So, in the single player campaign, we can only play as Mario. In the multiplayer deathmatch, sibling deathmatch is a bit more freeform. You can play as any you want. I ain't touching the multiplayer or single player skirmish though, the campaign should provide well enough in that regard. Mario is fresh off the plane, just got to his uncle's house in Little Italy. Sorry, Little Italy. He goes in to say hi to his uncle. Hello, uncle. Bring me bullets! This fucker has been waiting however long for his nephew to turn up, just so he doesn't have to get up off his fat ass to extort the gun dealer right across the bloody road. Then the restaurant next door. Not a good first impression. Uncle Vincenzo is a useless and lazy man. Mario has been in the country for all of an hour and has been in two gunfights. It doesn't end there though. Vincenzo puts Mario to work, hands us 20 grand, gives us an old woman with a shotgun and tells us to murder a bloke down the street who also has his own mafia family. Despite some deaths along the way, including Mario's, we eventually win. T-Gun is dead, a proud Vincenzo tells Mario to get some ravioli and a good night's sleep. The story is presented through these slides, just over 50. On their own they tell a dumb, disconnected tale of revenge. With gameplay, they do it over the course of 26 hours. I don't actually mind the use of slides. They are cheesy and extremely mechanical in their writing, in conjunction with the badly scrubbed in-game screenshots. It looks so cheap, it swings right around to being hilarious and kinda charming. The fact that it takes itself completely seriously start to finish only helps with that. I also love the RANDOM capitalization of certain words. Can't say I know anything about Italian culture, but I'm curious if spontaneous emphasis is a thing. Gangland is a pretty simple RTS, obviously a smaller scale than your Command and Conquers and Starcraft with a great emphasis on individual units and business takeovers, as opposed to base building elements. You click on things, click on other things, and the game figures out what your intentions are, and things develop from there. You extort businesses to set up a flow of money and resources. What's that sissy ass doing in here? Hire troops out of back rooms upgrade guns and try and kill the enemy either by being clever or is much more likely in my case just by having more hired guns. Each unit in this game can take quite a beating and the standard of accuracy is pretty terrible. Small skirmishes can therefore feel a little sluggish, like really slow rushes to damage the other guy slightly faster, but enough firepower tends to speed things up. My strategy for most of the game was just to run right up into the enemy's face and then unload on the poor sods one at a time. 
The manual does advise taking cover and whittling enemies down, but my strategy works near enough just as well, and a lot faster to boot. The degree of micromanagement on hand is pretty small. Units heal manually from a shared pool of medkits, replenished automatically by extorting gun stores. You have free ammo types available that only differ in damage dealt, and units have to reload. In fact, unless they're in a battle, you have to make troops reload manually. So you can actually bait enemies into drying out their weapons and then doing the get in their face strat while they reload. And you know, the fact that you can actually run out of ammo also supports my get in their face strat. You can't miss if your gun is touching the fucker. It's economical. The only thing getting in the way of my strategy is the incredibly low stamina most units possess. They can only sprint for a very short period. Mario, meanwhile, can leg it like no one's business. It's great fun when he abandons his allies to be the first to get shot. By the way, Mario dying is an instant game over, so be careful with him, the impetuous fuck. Units low on health also suffer an incredible decrease in speed, accuracy, and fire rate. So the moment they're near death, it's best to start figuring ways to cover their retreat. This does lead to some tense moments, and lets you immediately visualize where the lead is flying. The battles are actually pretty fun to watch and rewarding to win. The sound effects are probably the biggest helper in this. Granted, that's possibly the only positive I have about the sound. The guns sound heavy and sharp, and that's about the only good thing going there. The controls on the camera, on the other hand, are pretty weak. At worst, they'll annoy you. At best, you'll adapt to them. The camera is always slanted down, and camera rotation is pretty sensitive, so finding a nice viewpoint is tricky. You also can't move the camera with any of the keys. You gotta push the ends of the screen with a mouse. Not a deal breaker, but definitely annoying. The directional keys do nothing, and WASD changes unit facing. Line of sight is actually a factor in this game. It doesn't affect much. A unit that's been attacked will retaliate, and his allies will immediately jump to defend them. Pulling off battle plans more complex than crowding an enemy and firing is awkward to pull off. The mouse is never quite exact on what you're pointing at, so selecting units is a bit fidgety. Pixel hunting isn't quite so fun. You can pause at any time, but some commands do not register until you unpause, and you can't stack too many commands. It's also a bit awkward about swapping units. So at times you'll be pausing, telling a unit what to do, unpause, rinse, wash, repeat. There's also no way to set unit formations or anything like that. Grouped units travel in a big uncoordinated blob, who will move roughly where you clicked. Granted, a great degree of strategic depth is not needed to win at this game, but the controls feel like they actively inhibit even trying. So, you know how some games have you lose your weapons between stages? Not fun, right? Well, that's not only what happens here. Thanks for selling my Tommy gun, Vincenzo. Do you mind explaining how you also lost all those units, businesses, and safe houses I got you last night? No, no explanation given. Instead, the trend of pushing all of his problems onto his nephew continues. We're given a shitty old car and told to kill three snitches. It's hard to fault the driving in Gangland. On the one hand, it is incredibly dull. Driving a car is more akin to picking up a brick and hovering it above the ground. The camera is still at a downward slant, so seeing what's up ahead is impossible beyond a certain point and just awkward. You can't mount the pavement, and on your max speed, even in the fastest car in the game, you're moving incredibly slowly. On the other hand, you're under no stress whatsoever. You're the only one on the road. The AI can't work vehicles. Plus, whilst in a car, you can aim attacks manually and with greater accuracy than troops have on foot. Cars are more like disposable hit points than anything else. But I mean, despite being disposable hit points, they are fucking flimsy. They explode so quickly that, well, you can get two or three kills off and that's handy, but don't depend on them too much. I should also point out that you have to control cars manually. You can't tell units in a car where to go and then manage your other troops. So using vehicles in sync with ground units, while not impossible, is incredibly limited, and removes quite a large number of tactical options from play. It is fortunate that you don't have to do anything requiring grace in these things. Paradise City is more like dodgems, but with only one participant at a time. I don't even make too much use of the things as I go and shoot those snitches to death.
Uncle immediately has more work for us, however. Is this the actual reason we're here to kill the brothers? Did they just stop fucking answering Vincenzo, and he wouldn't stop bitching over the phone to Mario about it? You know, just one day they didn't want to recapture the bistro right next door. Street girls working for Vincenzo have disappeared in another part of town, and rumours of another local Don had them knocked off. Our orders from Vincenzo are to investigate and shoot the Don on sight should we see him. Our objective marker is then placed right in his safe house. I have a feeling this is rigged. I mean, I'm very likely to catch sight of the guy if I go to his house. We bust in at what is possibly the worst time for the poor guy. Cops are there asking him for a bribe, he kicks off, and the police shoot him to death. And seemingly let Mario wander up and check his corpse, because we find out the fate of the girls. And that another family was involved. So, naturally, we have to go and kill them as well. And we do. Two levels in and we've wiped three crime families off of this slowly expanding map. It's at this point we get the first of 12 challenges. These are little mini scenarios that unlock super units on completion. They won't be of actual use to me for a few more hours yet. Our first challenge is the sniper challenge. The Russian Mafia promises that if we can survive an onslaught of enemies using just his snipers, proving how lethal we are, he'll allow us access to his snipers so we can be even more dangerous in the future when we actually fight the Russians. This is the one time in the game I actually feel the need to use cover. The snipers remain useful throughout the game, and this stage serves as a handy intro to how lethal they are. Shoot down street girls before they can stun you, and keep on top of the hired guns sent your way. Make Mario do runs out into the open to grab ammo crates to keep supplies topped up. It's a fun and tricky challenge. I do enjoy a majority of these. The main missions will run out of interesting scenarios very quickly, and while the challenges do follow suit, it takes a little bit longer. Though the 15 minute length on this one is more dull than challenging, especially considering how repetitive this combat can get. Grab some cover and get comfortable. The next morning Mario wakes up. The slide points out that it's a beautiful morning. He's not the only one to realise this, as two brand spanking new dons have decided to see the light of day. They actually sprung up overnight. And it's not only that, it must have been a really fucking busy morning since they've also managed to murder three politicians and pin the blame on the Mangano family. Vincenzo naturally has a plan for us to carry out. To get out of being framed for the murder of three public servants, we will murder four cops, don their uniforms, drive a stolen police car to their base of operations, and then use the disguises to get close to the dons, whereupon we'll shoot them, repeatedly. This is an incredibly stupid plan. Hell, the AI agrees, as they shoot us on sight. They could probably tell since, you know, we're the only people in this town capable of driving. The AI in general is a bit on the thick side regardless. At times they can't decide if a fight is worth it. Injured units try and limp to safety to heal up, but at times they'll just wander closer to you and crouch down. Baiting attacks is easy since aggro isn't really a thing, they'll just pick a target and give it everything to kill them. This can be hell if they decide to pile on Mario. Anything else and it generally works out in your favour but they're too dumb to be fooled by this. This stealth plan also isn't aided by the fact that friendly AI shoots anyone on sight unless you order them not to. Okay, that's mostly because I forgot to switch that off. But hell, they started it. Either way, I basically resolved the mission as I had the last two, with a whirlwind of murder. Three days in literally five dead families. Vincenzo will be able to explain this away to Police Chief O'Hara, making the two equally incompetent. I shot four cops to death right in front of the fucking station. Another day in Paradise City. Three more fucking families. Vincenzo promotes us to Capo Soto, so now we actually get an itty bitty cut for extorting those shops. And then he tells us to go and kill those three families for him. That's it. Murder three more families. On the same map. Same safe houses. Businesses and money reset. And for fuck's sake, Vincenzo, stop selling my fucking Tommy gun. It's the exact same deal as the last two missions. 
only longer. It also points out that we're fighting Russians now. Later on, we'll also fight Colombians. Further on from that, the Black Mafia. Then the Chinese and Japanese Mafias. No, not the Triad or the Yakuza, the Mafias. There's also reference to the Jewish Mafia, but I don't think they ever turn up. I'm bringing this up now because it basically never matters. Each Mafia uses the same pool of units and is functionally the same. It really is a Mafia melting pot over here. Oh boy, the Russians have snipers. I'd have them as well if I could actually hire them yet. Despite a few deaths along the way, the job is done. We're about to turn in for the night, but then one of Vinny's snitches runs up. We're not done playing Errand Boy yet. Uncle wants a package picked up. So we go and do that and... Gee, wonder what could have happened. Yeah, we wiped seven mobs off of the map, and Vincenzo the Forever fuck-up still manages to get kidnapped. Mario, deciding to think for himself for once in his life, wastes that fort by deciding to rescue him, piecing together that the Colombians did this by the appearance of AK-47 rounds. Unlike the Russians, who wouldn't have anything to do with such a garbage weapon, they much prefer their trusty Tommy guns, which every automatic in the game is. Mario also knows the Colombians are mostly at the harbour, better known as the docks. I have no idea why they felt the need for ominous quotes there. So, mission 5, the docks, taking place on a different map, the docks, better known as the docks. A Russian family knocking about here have heard of Mario's exploits and decided it would be best to point Mario at people they don't like. So the two team up against the local Colombian families, and they have bazooka units. It doesn't really make a difference as I just rush past them and shoot their boss to death. They really didn't add much. It's at this point, when you claim this safe house, that Mario decides to become a self-employed Don. And with that, the game opens up a bit. Mario immediately decides to find a wife and have children, and rope them into his revenge slash rescue plot. Okay, Click on a woman, and choose wisely from the three types on offer, because that determines what kids you get. It's funny, this is the only game I found myself looking at the manual to pick a goddamn wife. I don't think I've ever laughed at instructions as much as when I read Skill, Have Children. Be careful, they've only got three charges. So you run up to a woman, pay her several thousand quid, then she'll walk around your safe house, uncontrollable, but a failure state should she die, and she'll have kids for you. I went with the one that could have lawyers. Then she had two girls, who can never be lawyers, but can sway enemy units. The third kid turned out to be a lawyer, and was thoroughly disappointing. The Mangano family genetics are awful, case in point. I get that this is from Mario's point of view, but that ain't a beautiful child. That's fucking horrific. Another family makes an attempt on Mario's wife, and thus the mission concludes with us wiping another family off the map. So it's at this point we're the Dawn and the last set of features unlock. But from here on out, there's only one objective left in the course of the game, besides straight up murder, and we're a good way away from that objective, so prepare for repetition. Next morning, another Mafia family moves in. Hoo boy, welcome the neighbours. Well, that was fucking horrifying. Igor calls and says we should single-handedly kill them as well, and Mario decides to make this an opportunity to track down his brother. I guess he's given up on saving his uncle. Oh, our kid has grown up. Into a seductress. Okay, never mind next morning. It's been 20 years, and this has now become the longest revenge slash rescue mission ever. We're now our own boss. Now it's no one else's fault that we're losing everything between stages. We need money, bullets, and resources. How do we get those? Well, extortion, obviously. Go get stores under your thumb. At which point a delivery boy will spend 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, lugging shit to your vault. An annoying but understanding mechanic is that Mario or one of his kids has to be present to take over stores and hire troops. Different businesses pay out money and other resources. Obviously you need gun stores for bullets and medkits. Those luxury resources over on the right only have one purpose, and they tie into what is possibly the worst recruitment system I've ever seen in a real-time strategy game. You can only hire a select few units on the map itself. Street girls, bouncers, gunmen, and henchmen. 
they wander into the restaurants of paradise, waiting for a friendly local Don to wander in and give them work. Paradise is that kind of town. It's at this point in the game that those challenges and super units come into play. Twelve in total. They can only be hired over the phone. You have to be at a safe house to answer the bloody thing. The moment I realized a kid could work the phone, oh, that was such a fucking relief. And when I say you have to answer it, I mean it. You can't put out calls for super units or other services. You have to wait for a phone call at random to come through. Most of the time all you need is money, but sometimes it's also tied to doing a little mini mission or a resource. Now that we can kinda get super units, let's go over what's on offer. It's mostly either melee or firearm focused, with some outliers making up the gimmick units. Now, I never cared much for melee troops, even ones at the upper end of the scale, because I put more stock in overwhelming firepower than anything else. Melee troops can stun enemy units and leave them defenseless for a moment, but I'd rather have an extra gun doing decent damage. Gunmen and henchmen are the gunners you can hire from back rooms. Gunmen have greater accuracy, but henchmen rock the Tommy gun. And by that I mean they do that instead of actually aiming the fucking thing. Gunmen can also be set to guard buildings and people, which most units for some reason can't. It's a near useless feature anyway, and it doesn't add much to the units that do have it. That said, why can't bouncers guard things? Isn't that kinder in their job description? Street girls don't do damage, but they can run faster than bouncers, who I'd never use unless the mission just kinda handed them to me. Here I am sending some of them off to die. So, those are the core units. Onto the shit we gotta unlock. There are some straight upgrades. Bodyguards are better gunmen, Black Widows are better still, being the best unit in the game, having better accuracy and freight of fire than anything else at the cost of low health. The speed at which they kill things kind of renders that a moot point, however. And Super Bouncers are bouncers, but they're super. You're really struggling to think up 12 of these, aren't you? Assassins, funnily enough, well, they're just better street girls. And ninjas are better than bouncers, super otherwise. Both of them also possess stealth, which renders them invisible to most enemy types. And that means if you're up against them, you have to target them manually. The unit variety is actually used semi-well in this regard. You have to pay attention in gunfights to keep tabs on enemy melee troops, whilst also managing the long-range fuckers. Now we get to the more out there stuff. The thief can pickpocket NPCs, nick cars, and throw stun grenades. He's handy, but it's so easy to screw yourself over with stun grenades that I usually wouldn't bother. The Big Mama. Tons of health, carries a shotgun that does a good amount of damage, and can heal other units. Which, considering the healing system, is a little surplus to requirement, but it could rarely be handy. All of this if you can also deal with the fact she walks faster than every other unit in the game, rather inexplicably. Yeah, looking threatening. Keep walking, fuckers. I can't beat the mission to unlock infiltrators. While units with stealth are workable, actual line of sight stealth in this game is so rudimentary that the one time the game attempts it, it does not work. Try to make your way to an enemy safe house. One small slip-up results in one capable combat unit, Mario, getting overwhelmed and killed. They didn't seem too grand anyway. They can take one enemy unit's identity and then they're stuck there. I can live without it. The challenge to unlock the bomber might actually be broken. As in, one of the objectives you need to blow up has no trigger. It doesn't matter anyway, for two reasons. One is that I don't see any reason to blow up buildings ever. Buildings mean money. Taking them, even from enemy hands, is not hard. Two, one of the random phone missions gives you one for free on condition you blow up a building, and failing it doesn't revoke the unit. So fuck it. This game fucked up once, fucked up again, and the second fuck up created a workaround for the first. I used it to blow up a police station, you know, to see if they would stop spawning. The police didn't. We also have the bazooka unit. Slow, awkward, but pretty damaging. Otherwise, not really all that noteworthy. It's not like vehicles are something I'm going to have to contend with. So the selection of units on hand is decent, and super units you hire over the phone go into a different pool than the ones you get off the street, so it's in your best interest to grab both. 
There is that whole phone problem though. If I want a good number of units, I have to sit on my ass and wait for the right phone call. So if your strategy involves a truck, several powerful units and a Humvee, have fun waiting half an hour in a game with no auto saves, very sparse checkpoints and a predilection for crashing. Missions can take a couple of hours, so get comfortable. This is by far and away the most half-baked way of handling recruiting in a game I've ever seen. It also makes me not want to unlock certain units to begin with. I have a small cap on troops. I can only have so many at a time, so an infiltrate will take a valuable slot away from more possible firepower. Not to mention, unlocking that unit in the first place would just pollute the unit pool lowering my odds of a phone call coming through offering a unit that I actually want. And the odds are already stacked against that. Fuckers who want to trade luxury resources for money. Fuckers warning you about bounties wandering the town. Fuckers telling you about the kids the other bosses are having. Fuckers offering you medkits or ammunition for money. Fuckers offering loans. Fuckers selling cars. Fuckers who want me to go on a killing spree with offers of money or super units. Fuckers who want me to kill business owners in exchange for a super unit. Okay, if you two pricks have the super unit, why do you even need me? Don't you hate it when you're driving down the road and your boss answers the phone, obscuring your view? You see, I can understand the rationale of the phone system. We're playing the big boss man, people come to me with their problems, and if the money is right, the problem goes away. Probably a bit more than $67. In practice, however, it just bogs everything down. Why can't we ring people up? I've got lots of money. Let me buy a yellow pages and I'll hire some super units myself. The phone system is entirely one way and it's so annoying for it. There are better ways than this to handle super units. An upper limit on the amount you can hire of any one type. An ever increasing price for hiring the same unit. A cooldown timer on hiring, requiring more businesses to increase your available pool on super units. Anything that would give this a sense of agency and planning over luck of the draw. Conquest 6 and 7 are the exact same level, played twice in a row. Only Conquest 8 has one extra family so it's a bit longer. I'm not kidding, and I've said it before, same map, same objectives, but all your shit's taken away and you gotta wait on those super units again. And I also have to recapture the neighborhood for the third time in a row. This is transcending repetition and turning it into an art form. At the end of level 6, the Russian we teamed up with dies somehow. He did basically nothing the whole time we've been here, so I'm not that beaten up over it. But it does mean that in level 7, some Russians that somehow blame us for his death move in to fight us, and well, you can imagine just how well that goes for them. The Russians operate exactly like the Colombians, who operate exactly like the Italians. It's a shallow thing, but in real-time strategy, I need different factions to actually differentiate. And I mean more than this nation of shit farmers feels better Ashigaru than these fuckers who reload 15% faster. Different troop trees, specializations, unique units locked off to those fuckers so you've got to plan around them. I did say the amount of units in the game was decent, but it doesn't help that every family uses them. The lack of variety and repetitive use of the same map means that by a certain point I stop thinking, stop caring, and I just play it like a bloody automaton. Another funny thing about these two missions is that since Mario has raised two kids separately to adulthood and has just had a bloody third, he hasn't lifted a finger. If he dies, it's game over. Not so for his kids. So like any good mob boss, he's parked in his safe house with his thumb up his ass while his daughters risk life and limb for his dumb revenge. So, family's wiped out, and after doing nothing for once in his life, Mario decides to take a holiday. Well, Mario's on vacation, and I've got a few challenges backlogged. Unlocking the Big Mama is a rescue mission, and one of the few times I use Street Girls, and basically it's because I was made to. Other than that, it's a straight combat challenge. Shoot stuff like you always do. The Thief actually mixes things up a little. You've got to use him to steal a car and drive it to the end of the map. Several roadblocks stand in your way. So it's a good way of introducing you to his mechanics, and it makes you use drive-bys. It's also under a pretty tight time limit. On the whole, a tense and well-crafted scenario. The assassin, like I said, is a street girl on steroids. They run up and poison enemies, stunning them. Funny part is, I didn't really use them much on their own mission. So I didn't really poison the enemy boss as asked. 
I mean, unless this counts as lead poisoning. Look, three more units in the pool and big mamas are all I'm going to make use of. So, Mario went on holiday. How fucking well do you think that went? He goes away, the holiday is skipped over in a story slide, and by the next slide he's back home and everything has gone to shit. No businesses, one safe house, barely any units, and a Humvee. That's what we've got to work with. This is the one time the game explains why we lost all of our stuff. It does it every mission anyway. Why is this the one case of justifying it? And for such a bloody pointless reason. The game is usually more generous, I guess. You usually have one or two businesses, so there's at least some cash flow. Here, no such luck. You can't extort businesses without spending money, but you basically get pittance for it. Something strange also happened on this mission. I think a developer fell asleep at their desk, landed on the wrong keys, and set the aggression to 255 out of 10. The enemies rush you with an aggression that is not approached even on later stages. From the very get-go, you are backed into a corner and pummeled. I want it noted as well, enemy families ignore each other. They only care about you. Which, considering Little Italy, makes complete sense. But I'm still not happy. The biggest threat on this map, however... Enemies are spawning and attacking faster than my supply line of bullets can keep up with. The shared pool of bullets is definitely not helping me out here. I was dying over and over and over again, just trying to get settled and establish a foothold. It's this mission, more than any other, that made me change the way I played the game. The way I've handled things so far has been pretty safe. Start the mission, grab businesses, build up resources, Get a good deadly blob of units and then fight through enemy territory, stopping to heal and grab footholds along the way. When the enemy safe house is in sight and I have a good number of explosive bullets, I storm the building and win. This approach would not cut it here. I can buy a gun shop on the map, but then I would not have the time to recoup the money and hire units. Not to mention, if I leave the gun shop, enemies will storm it and I'd lose the bloody thing. So, what I have is a moderate amount of units, enough ammo for two or three gunfights tops, and a Humvee. It's here I had to make a paradigm shift. When an enemy boss dies, his children all immediately drop dead with him, and whatever loyalty his troops possessed vanishes. Bygones be bygones, and everyone stops shooting each other. Cut off the head, and the body will die. The moment I realized that, it stopped being about an uphill fight for enemy territory. It became about killing the enemy boss at whatever cost. If circumstance meant I'd have to play slower, well, then that's that. But if I can kill the enemy Don as quickly as possible, that's what I would have to do. The further I got into the game, the more sense this strategy made. Nothing else was really all that viable. Enemies aren't beholden to resources the same way I am. They have infinite ammo, infinite medkits, and they shit out new units as needed. I could push an enemy back, but I'd still need to recover, unlike the guy who just threw some poor mooks into the meat grinder. Taking enemy businesses out from under them doesn't impede them in any way. I'm not cutting off their supply. I mean, I'm getting a bit more dosh, so it helps me, but it doesn't hurt them. Playing defensive is still a simple affair, and while I'm building up my death blob, I kinda have to stay defensive. Enemies will usually pick a building to attack and not move on to a different building until that one is taken away from me. They will rarely, if ever, go for the safe house as well. My unit cap is small and enemies move in packs, so why would I spread my troops thin just so I had a better visual? Just wait to see which building they attack, go back when the new owner replaces the dead one, buy it from them and park my units there. Great protection racket, right? Early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse doesn't get shafted by the mafia. But this is what every mission pretty much becomes. Get enough businesses under my thumb that I'm completely liquid, Money's no object, and income snowballs so hard at a certain point that it doesn't really matter how much I have, I'll just always have enough. Build up a death blob of the most powerful units I can muster. The amount of time this takes is pretty much dependent on how long I'm willing to wait for the RNG phone to hand me the good stuff. Hope to fuck the game doesn't crash before I kill an enemy boss, because those are the checkpoints now. And yeah, the game crashed on me a good number of times. Then once I've got my death stack, I put one poor sod in a car and drive it to their safe house to see what it looks like and figure out the quickest route. Then I pile everyone else in a truck, drive it to their front door, dive out, run in and leg it right for the boss. Game winning strap and only one poor scout has to die. The other deaths are entirely dependent on how well they do their job. 
The hardest part of every mission is therefore the opening. And from there it just gets easier and easier. You get resources and enemy families die. Resistance just falters as you increasingly build up. The difficulty scales up from mission to mission, but within the missions themselves, it's completely backwards. When this game is hard, it is aggravatingly so. Simple mistakes lead to death, which leads to upwards of half an hour of lost progress. The hardest part is also early on because you need to risk a boss or underboss to capture those businesses, so you're at your most vulnerable during the setup period. When you don't have any units or cash flow and the enemies can still chuck their raiding parties at you with no cost to themselves. I do actually like the balance forcing business on the leader creates, but it means that once business is done, I can park the leader somewhere safe on the map and not even worry about losing. Also, there are five goddamn families on this stage besides mine. It is the same stage I have already played three times at this point. All that has changed is that the invisible walls have moved back a street or two. A couple of dead families in and Mario finds a note referencing Angel Face. And Mario works out that it's his brother Angelo. I ended up accidentally going to the right safe house and killing him, ending the mission nice and early. Our brother is a bit of a twat. He confesses he didn't kill Chico, so revenge on him was meaningless, but he also doesn't explain further, and then he points Mario in the direction of another sibling. It's like he didn't want to squeal and squealed at the exact same time. Why is Mario so torn up about the death of his brother anyway? He, well, okay, I, got both of his daughters killed in this pointless territorial dispute on the way over here. Right, Conquest 9, 10 hours in, and finally on the third map. You know, I laughed on the inside when I realized that. It was a laugh born of pain, but it was still a laugh. We're here to kill Tom Jones. Looking at the picture of the guy, I'd argue it's more about putting him out of his misery. Funny thing, the strategy I just devised and spent a while hailing its greatness? That won't actually work right away on this map, at least not for the first time we'll be here. The suburbs map is the most forgettable one in the game. It's split into two halves, with a single bridge linking the two. You can't drive over the bridge, so thanks for the bloody truck. It also means I can just go back to turtling like a little bitch and attack Tom Jones at my leisure. I also had another kid last mission, and he's all grown up into a lawyer now. They turn out to be disappointing, so I park this one at home to answer the phone for his whole life. It turns out he passively increases money earned, so that's nice. He can also hire people off the street, but frankly I don't give a shit, he's too slow to catch up with anyone. I was really considering not having another child since, you know, they take up UI space, but I did need someone to work that fucking phone. You know what else isn't helping with the repetition inherent in this game? The fact that the musical tracks are barely five minutes long, and the point at which they loop is not even concealed. There is also the fact that the battle music plays every time there is a gunfight involving you anywhere on the goddamn map. The music overall is pretty forgettable, it's vaguely appropriate ambient stuff. And because there are only four maps total, that means there are five tracks you will be hearing over and over again, for over a fucking day. This battle music though, every gunfight, every time one of my collectors is attacked, every fight in one of my businesses, you piss off the cops once and they will harass you for near enough the rest of the session, and they too will start slinging shots your way. Fuck it, this is actually drilled into my mind at this point. I've come around to hating it so much that I actually kind of respect it. I'm sure that if this is played in my presence, I'll immediately start looking for a goddamn maid man looking to plug me or something. It'll definitely poke me up. It doesn't help that when writing this section, I started listening to the battle music on loop, and I didn't even realize I was doing it. I do love the game over track though. Way to fucking rub it in, gangland. In later stages where I was dying a lot, this was actually starting to get to me. I was being irritated, the taunting prick of a video game. The Suburbs map is played three times in total. First with one enemy family, then twice with two families. You recapture the same businesses, the enemies get more aggressive, and the second family is actually on your side of the map, so they can't be bottlenecked at the bridge. The resources are a bit different on this map. Rather than booze, stolen goods, vehicle parts, and stolen antiques, in the suburbs they don't really care about antiques. Here, it's embarrassing pictures. 
which you get by extorting hotels. A man may then ring you at random and request a certain number of them in exchange for his services. Doesn't even care if they're blackmail worthy. It could just be a picture of the mayor slipping on a banana peel. That's an embarrassing picture. When it comes to blackmail, you should be really be worried about quality over quantity. We're not getting any outside income, so I think we can safely assume that the docks has grown 20 more mob families in the time since we left. Cleaning up this town is fucking Sisyphean. Why is this game bothering to name anyone? Hello Marlon twins, you're dead now. What's that? Sonny escaped. Mario's brother, having successfully devoured 22 apples in the past. Alright. What a shit anecdote about your brother you want to murder. Sonny escapes to the exact same map as we enter Conquest XI and repeat exactly what we did. Again. This time we actually end with killing the sod. Mario finds a note pointing out the one remaining sibling's location at the casino strip that this nonsensical cesspit of a city also somehow has, and so Mario takes his mind off of fratricide by buying a condo closer to the next one he intends to murder. In relative terms, the suburbs are a breather. Not as interesting as Little Italy, easier than the docks, and definitely easier than the strip. It comprises one-fifth of the game itself, and it's just kind of there. In a game which by itself can count as just kind of there. Only notable challenges here are for the Super Bouncer and the Bodyguard. So all we're leaving the suburbs with are better versions of a unit I don't use and... Okay, I don't have a joke. The Bodyguard is actually pretty handy. The Bouncer challenge is a trek across the suburbs whilst under assault from Bouncer patrols. It's a massive loss of life because as it turns out, no matter how stupid you're bouncing, bullets hurt. I did have to leave a man behind to distract the horde as I cleared the finish line, and he died for basically no reason. The bodyguard challenge is a bit more regular. Just hunt down and shoot some blokes. It's pretty much what I'm doing already, but on a smaller scale. At the strip, we team up with Aaron Dembski who will sit back and do nothing while we fight the Chinese and Japanese mafias. Just like everyone else who ever claims to help Mario. But hell, he did give me a Humvee and a sports car. The gimmick with the strip is that near enough every building costs more, but it also pays out more. So in the long term, it means absolutely nothing. A bit slower start up, sure, but once money starts coming in, everything's liquid. Same as ever, go to the church, receive a blessing for a health boost, and then use God's blessing to murder a bunch of Yaku, made men of a chivalrous organization. The first mission is pretty easy, not too heavy on enemy resistance, and you're not getting charged every bloody second. This is just building a full sense of security, however. As Mario plans his next battle against two more Asian families, he gets a ring from Akimoto, and lo and behold, he has Vincenzo hostage, and has for the last 60 years. He tells Mario to get their sharpish so they can discuss Ransom. I jump in the Humvee and floor it down the empty streets of this god-awful Vegas knockoff. Once there, we're given half an hour to accumulate one million dollars. We're also not allowed to kill his ally, who will harass us and disrupt our businesses while we try and make up the funds for his mate. I uh, kind of skimmed over that part. One of the main reasons the strip is so hard compared to everything else is that, for the most part, the enemy spams ninjas at this point, and they will charge you in great number. If they just decide to attack Mario, that's it. Your fate has been decided. So it's a little irritating, especially early on in this mission when I can't spend money on troops, I've got to be building it up. So I can't have a big defense force around Mario pretty early on in the mission. So it's very precarious, and more than a little annoying. And the thing is, I want it pointed out, because I'm about to shit on this game more than I already have been, I want to like this. This game is stupid. It comes off more naive and innocent than malicious. And I kind of like that about it. It just feels so stupid and of its time. It's obviously a budget title and that's why the maps are repeated so often, but because the manual lies about that, I don't cut it that bit of slack. It claims to have 20 maps in the manual. Um, maybe I'm being unfair on it? The problem is I also want to like this. It's just being so fucking difficult about it. I think it's the fact that I like games that are rough around the edges. Something that's incredibly polished, it'll probably be fun, yeah, but if you get that as something that's rough around the edges, you also get to see where the imperfections lie and where it gets a bit weird now they had to do some things to make it work in the long term. I enjoy that about games that it's kind of unpredictable and bizarre. 
But that also comes with a double-edged sword of the rough edges being incredibly annoying. Or at least they can be, and this is the case with Gangland. Why does Mario care about his uncle this much? You've sent two daughters to their graves for less than this, and you brush that off. It's time to let go. Either way, I tried. I grabbed businesses up and down the strip, fought to get them back when they were taken from me, and I died over and over again. After all, Mario needs to be at the business for a takeover, so the boss is exposed for the whole mission. I can't afford to actually spend money on units, I can only spend it on complete takeovers. But that's a risk in and of itself, because I can't split the troops to cover more businesses, and the other family can field more units at a time than me, and they travel in a death blob. My paradigm shifted again. Forget the businesses for a bit. If I can kill the other boss, I can grab the businesses unimpeded, and also take whatever businesses he had. Right, let's do it. How fucking stupid I was. I spent a long ass time trying to kill something that I'm not even allowed to. Suffice to say, I wasn't happy. And this more than anything else fucks me over. So I doubled back, playing defensive, grabbing businesses and retaking them as they were stolen from me. And with only a few minutes left on the clock and less than half the money, I was about ready to throw in the towel on this whole thing. Cut the review here and have the happy ending of Vincenzo ending up at the bottom of a lake in cement shoes. Why wouldn't anyone quit at this point? Even if I win, what's my reward? The opportunity to play this map three more times in a row, each time getting tougher and longer, having to retake every business in the fucking 20 minute setup period, and that's if the AI doesn't go ultra aggressive again. I will admit, some of the battles are still enjoyable, there is a layer of tactical depth and manoeuvring inherent in them, keeping melee troops in healing so you can't be stunned, moving around the map to cut off or funnel enemy troops, covering allies so they can heal mid-fight, setting up big mummers at the front and snipers to fight the stragglers or other snipers. Battles are responsive and chaotic. A bit bullet spongy, sure, but the pace works out well. It's for people who are a bit slower when it comes to RTS. People like me, basically. I'm not big on the genre, but it at least makes me feel like I'm thinking, and when it pulls that off, I'm enjoying myself. It's just that everything surrounding the fighting is such tedious, bullshit, busy work. If the AI were more dynamic, if I had a bigger unit cap, if the start period were made shorter by removal of that stupid RNG recruitment, I would actually enjoy this game somewhat. I've only given up on beating one game before reviewing it before this point, and that was pretty shoddy and lazy of me. But what would be different if I stopped now? I'd be happier if anything. But then, just then, the game backs down. Mario himself realizes he'd never make the money in time. He decides to rush the Akimoto safe house and free Vincenzo the old-fashioned way. Suffice to say, it's pretty cathartic. What a stage. I wish I could sum up my exact blend of emotions to that back down, but I think I blocked them out. I know they weren't all negative. Perhaps an annoyed relief? It's a twist that would be annoying in any game, but at least somewhere else it might feel clever. Oh. We end the mission with $560,000 and a whole uncle. Vincenzo seems sad. Boy, I fucking wonder why. A split second later, one of Dembski's boys walks in and warns us that Sakurai's men have surrounded our safe house, wife and son still inside. Then he leaves. And a young Japanese boy walks in and tells us the exact same thing. Crap, Mario thinks to himself, this time deciding that from the mouth of a young Japanese boy, now he has a threat to eliminate. How did you piss away $540,000? It's been two fucking seconds. Did you tip the young Japanese boy? Well, first things first. Let's test how surrounded we are. Yeah, pretty surrounded. And reload. It's basically another time limit. Only issue is it's essentially random. Eventually one of the AI will wander into my safe house, at which point the wife and son dies. So, I've got to figure this one out sharpish. I can't get enough troops out here to break the stalemate, and vehicles spawn outside the surrounded safe house. It's also at this point that most of the static enemies on the map are Black Widows and Snipers. Enemies also seem to have better health and accuracy than before, and a lovely way to increase difficulty when they already have fucking Black Widows. And while at this point I've unlocked them myself, fielding an army full of them will take a long time of waiting on the right phone calls. Still, it's actually putting faith in that stupid RNG that will pull my ass out of the fire here. Super units hired over the phone walk in through the back door of your first safe house. 
so I can sneak a bunch of people in round back. So I had to wait and hope on a decent unit spawning, and I got one just in time to save the secretary. So while I was building an army right under their noses, Mario was steadily hiring and fighting his way back across the map. The manual has a fucking meatball recipe at the back. In what was probably the most complicated maneuver I pulled off over the course of the game, and well that isn't saying much, I had most of Mario's men run out on the far end of the street, drawing the fire of the myriad snipers and black widows. Then the super unit stormed out the safe house right into the center mass of the enemy, gunning them down before they could shift priorities. The stalemate was broken. Then the game crashed and I did it again later. From here on out, it's a bog standard kill em all mission with nothing unique to set it apart. Kill two more mob families, golly gee aren't there a lot of those in this city. Mario's wife doesn't like Vincenzo lounging around the safe house, so she asks Mario to ask him to move out. And Mario agrees, deciding that he's repaid whatever debt he may have owed Vincenzo. Y you fucking what? Then the wife kills over dead and Vincenzo is gone. Mario, stricken with grief, blames Romano, who clearly snuck into the safe house and poisoned her. So we set off to kill Romano and four other families who've also turned up and grabbed the safe houses we just cleared, and yet two more families now have been the fray because the end of level walls have moved back a street or two. So the wife is dead. Well, at least that means... Oh wait, never fucking mind. Mario, you bloody drama queen. Best killer, just to be sure. It's at this point I realised how I could have beat the infiltrate mission. You control click on anything and you're allowed to shoot it. Well, fuck it, I don't need them taking up a unit slot. No, she gets to live. Reload. It's amazing when dismantling organized crime through violence can become so routine. Don't get me wrong, this mission is hard. They actually harass you pretty heavily on this stage, so moving quickly is vital. But it's the same story that we've seen several times now. Killing them is so shallow. Get a good number of units, scout with car, make a rush to cut off the head of the family, and repeat. I actually tried to combo an offensive in car and on foot but my units ran out of breath halfway down the road and it threw the whole attack out of sync. I eventually got the bugger through much more traditional truck tactics. Romano had the decency to set up an obstacle course, I guess. He provides a decent battle mostly because he doesn't spam Black Widows like I'm not allowed to. I definitely would, though. Mario, having not been present in-game for Romano being shot to death, rushes over to hear the big twist. Vincenzo framed the brothers for Chico's death and everything we've done has been pointless. They still brought it on themselves though for not saying a fucking word to me about it and saving me all this hassle! Mario decides that Vincenzo needs to die slowly, on board, painfully, got it, and immediately. I have no idea how you're going to pull this one off Mario, but you've clearly never fought straight before. Right, abandon all the safe houses, cut off all my business transactions, donate $2,090,000 to the National Men the Mafia Foundation and wait for the fuckers to infect the neighborhood. I'll be doing the challenges in the meanwhile. The Ninja Challenge is probably my favorite. It even has a map all its own. Fight through a park at night, fending off ninjas in the hunt for free swords. It makes good use of the line of sight system, and the fact you have to auto-target and keep looking for more ammo makes it an incredibly tense challenge. Black Widow is just the bodyguard challenge, but longer. Kill four fucks wandering the map. It's fun, however, because of how ridiculously powerful Black Widows are. You just tear shit to shreds, no problem. The Bazooka Challenge. You've got two street girls to stun enemies, and Mario to deliver the killing blow or 30. In the end, I just decided fuck it and ran past the goalposts. A win's a win, right? You know, I haven't really mentioned explosives, really all that much. I don't use them that much because friendly fire is a thing in the case of explosives. Mario's secondary attack is throwing dynamite, and on one occasion Mario managed to kill himself with a stick of TNT. It's handy in the early game due to the shit accuracy of Mario and his other units, and the sheer damage of the TNT, but it's so risky to use, and I actually sort of like that about it. But it does make me wary of a unit that's all about explosions, and reloads and walks slowly besides. So. What's the last challenge before the final mission? A businessman? No, I think the time for businessmen has long since passed. Let's just get this show on the road. Look at that splash screen. Like all others, just a zoomed in, washed out in engine screenshot. I burst out laughing. Every time you die, you see that face as you reload, looking at you, judging you, 
This fucker couldn't even extort the shop next door. He was thoroughly dependent. Possibly the dumbest villain ever. He set up a kidnapping with the Yakuza to get a cut of a million dollars, which takes like a week if you just extort some fucking shops and sit back. Yet here he is, in a loading screen, making that stupid fucking face each and every time you die. This is by far and away the most contemptible video game uncle. And yeah, I know I've reviewed Watch Dogs. I'm gonna stand by my statement though. As we head into the 16th Conquest, I have one last surprise in store for you. It's not a pleasant one. There are actually lightweight level up mechanics in Gangland. Normal units will only level up their combat skills a stage or two, granting greater health and accuracy. Mario levels up combat skill, business skill, granting a flat percentage to his profits, and his leadership skill, granting extra basic unit slots, up to a maximum of 8, with two more unit slots for each still living child. Look at my unit slots. Lots of red crosses, right? I made a very dumb assumption early on, and was only now questioning it. I thought this was just upping the challenge, and I didn't have a say in it. But why the fuck would I have a skill leveling up my number of unit slots if they would just be arbitrarily closed? Mario has a cap on how much he can level up per stage, so you can't just steamroll the early game. I then guessed it was because I let two kids die, but that doesn't explain quite how strict this is. I've got four unit slots, and however many super units allowed. It wants me to take on the final stage with this? Well, as it turns out, there is a rule that is only mentioned offhandedly in the manual. It just comes out of nowhere and is never mentioned again. For every 10 troops you lose in a mission, you lose a unit slot. You can replay missions in an attempt to do better and regain that slot. Simply put, fuck that. I am by far and away more stubborn than patient. I tell developers to format their guides better, but fuck it, those don't exist anymore, so that's yelling into a bloody void. Who's that on the phone? Wait, Vincenzo is having kids? He's like 140 years old. Stop having kids. And guess what? It's exactly the same as the last mission. I realize they only made four maps that have been cut into smaller versions, but why didn't the last mission take place in Little Italy? We never actually got to be a Don there. We were always the errand boy. It would at least give this dumb shaggy dog story a sense of closure. It'd also be harder. The cheaper stores would make saving up for super units slower. The manual claims there are over 20 maps. There are not. There are four. They have just been cut up. I just went over this, but I just remembered it in my script. Oh boy. Fuck it. Let's build whatever stack I can muster and try not to die as I mechanically destroy families on the road to Vincenzo. I busted into one just as he went upstairs to have a kid. Obviously we can't follow him, that'd be rude. So instead we wait downstairs and hold the line until he comes back and is summarily shot. Despite the unit cap, despite boredom, Without even caring about the knowledge that this is soon to be over and done with, I plod forward pointlessly towards a resolution I have no expectations for, beyond the expectation that it won't meet them. The Death Stack dies charging a van barricade, the game then also crashes. Hell of a setback. But that looks like the finish line. Who else but Vincenzo would park trucks outside in the middle of the road? The charge strategy is not working, so a new game is played. Store hopping slowly advancing from store to store, taking cover and funneling foes to their deaths. I work my way to Vincenzo over again. The battle theme is no longer music, it's Pavlovian, an ingrained response telling me to check the minimap. Not that I can hear the music much anymore, I'd started listening to the bugle instead. Vincenzo is in sight. Like I've done so many times before, dash to the end of the room, ignoring all other factors. As long as Vincenzo dies, no one else in this room matters. Mario isn't even there when it happens, and this is all we get for it.
the credits are playing the game over music. I mean, yeah, it's correct, but it isn't right. Fuck, I hope you all enjoyed Gangland. I'd usually do a conclusion, wrap up all my thoughts into a nice cohesive package, but I don't think I can put it better than you're dead, dead, dead.